Canadian fundamentalist Shiite teachings. These are separately the same group of people we believe have held the seven hostages, which go back almost well over a year now, including the Buckley, Jenko, Weir, or others. The President's direction since the beginning has been to <coughs> seek through diplomatic measures first to bring pressure to bear on the two groups that have custody of the American hostages. <coughs> as you know, the captors have made as their demands the release by Israel of prisoners taken as they departed southern Lebanon. The President's position has been clear, and that is that we do not believe it sensible to make concessions to hijackers on any source today, <coughs> Japan, <coughs> and neutral countries. The state of play now is that uh, we believe Barry's motives in seizing general control of this were to further his own political ambitions. That is, if he could secure the release of Shia prisoners, surely it would help consolidate his own leadership in the country, which has been historically weak, particularly in southern Lebanon, where most of those prisoners come from. At the same time, I believe that he has begun to get the message that his earlier expectations that we would lean on Israel to release those prisoners is not going to occur. And that over time, time which we believe is not on his side, the pressure that will come on him from others in his own movement, as well as from other Lebanese, and we hope in Syria, lead him to release our own prisoners, since that is the only way we can expect to get the full release of those held now in Israel. Israel has been consistent and just yesterday in a letter to the President has made clear its support for our policy and its wish to be helpful not only on this occasion but in countering terrorism more generally. President Assad, in response to a letter from President Reagan, has said that he We'll try to be helpful as an occasion for that. We understand that Barry is in Damascus and clearly the Syrian leadership has the influence to be able to persuade Barry to release those people if they want to. And that I think that looking for that kind of pressure from Syria is reasonable on our part beginning two years ago, it's been apparent that Syrian support for not only the Shia, but for the Iranian Revolutionary Guards who have infiltrated Lebanon could not have been there except that the sufferance of Syria and with their support. The President directed as well that we examine and pursue every diplomatic avenue that holds some promise. Secretary of State has been working around the clock and getting general very solid cooperation, notably, as I said, from the Algerians. There have been offers as well from international organizations, the UN Secretary General, the Red Cross, and in a somewhat different context, not as negotiators, but as facilitating release if agreements are reached. In addition, however, the President believes that it's essential that there be some cost, and over time, that there is an end to patience. He's made emphatically clear and publicly that he doesn't envision a indiscriminate, violent attack upon innocent people, and yet there are measures that can be taken to affect the climate in which those hijackers live, and the Beirut generally. Among the more benign and still promising steps that might be taken 
are to stop the flow of goods and services into Beirut and to other Lebanese ports. This could be done using naval forces and without the need for violence. There is as well value in emphasizing to the American people and to the global community that the airport there in Beirut has become a center of terrorism, of harboring terrorists, of making possible hijackings. Secretary Schultz pointed out in his appearance Sunday that in the past 15 years, 37 hijacking incidents have been involved with the Beirut International Airport. About 15% of the global hijackings have either originated there, ended there, or gone through there with safe haven. And so, closing that airport, the reasonable thing to do in the interest of the international community. One can consider a number of means for doing that, such as simply calling upon the international community to prohibit their own carriers from going into that airport. And contrary to popular opinion, there are quite a number of airlines that do. Many of them Eastern Bloc and probably might not adhere to a call. But many Western countries as well, European countries, other Arab countries, and particularly if our call included that for those who did not go along, that there might be the limitation of their service to this country, it could be a benign and yet effective way of bringing to a close the use of that airport. I stress again, the President has directed that all of these diplomatic avenues be pursued vigorously first, but that we make ready further escalatory ladder designed to bring pressure to bear on the Shia leadership and those who can influence it that our policy shall not change without making concessions to the hijackers nor of asking others to do so. <coughs> Glad to take your questions. I'm a little over it's, if I could respond. Uh, Just one question. Although they're despicable, they're not fools. Why would it, my concern is that their only way to safety is keeping the hostages. That they would fear, or at least reasonably expect, that once they gave them up, even if they free, or if they really free the prisoners, even if there's not linkage, that he might go in and go the off the face of the earth. It's not that it would occur to all of us to come in. What is the administration's thinking on? on them not just keeping the hostages, who is their only route? Same line. Well, we rely in the first instance on their concluding that if their goal is to get those prisoners back, it won't happen until they release the hostages. However, we believe that when we say applying pressure, that isn't to say that it's an immediate threat of violence. Pressure is designed to influence the climate in which other Lebanese live, live, such as the Druze and the Sunni, who do have some influence on the Shia there in Beirut, so that if it becomes less comfortable for the entire community there, their ability to translate pressure on the Shias, I think, and incentives go up. The question does arise as to what must be, over time, a viable strategy for deterring terrorism and coping with it when it occurs. And I think every rational analyst in the administration recognizes that there must be a cost, and that a sustained ability of this country, in terms of political support and the means to deliver violent action to preempt or to respond to terrorist measures, Clear. In the short term, there is the risk that that threat, repeated constantly, provides an incentive for holding on to the hostages. And that's why this deliberation and means short of violence are those the President intends to exercise first. Even the supplemental appropriations bill, it would be unfortunate if we 
can't successfully resolve these two conferences prior to the recess. And I'm going to call on Dave to please outline the status of the two conferences. <coughs> Mr. President, let me start on the supplemental because I think we're making good progress on that and we should focus where we can come very close to agreement. <clears throat> that is a $13.5 billion supplemental, but most of the money in it is for pretty routine things that we're all agreed on. About nine billion is replenished, accounts like the CCC and veterans benefits and so forth. It's about a billion and a half is for pay supplemental for routine. I think everybody's pretty well agreed there. <coughs> There were a couple of items that could have been contentious, but I think that we ought to be in a position where these can be solved. One is the water projects. We've had a fight for two and a half or three years on this. Some in the Congress wanted to go with appropriations and new starts for an authorization bill. We have consistently said that we're willing to support new starts if we can get an authorization bill first in some reform in terms of user fees and cost sharing. This uh, argument has gone on, but I think in the last week we've achieved a breakthrough, which consists of two things. One, putting a fence around the appropriations in the supplemental, that the uh, money will be available only consistent with the reform measures that, that we would like to pass. And then second, uh, we've worked out some principles in terms of pot sharing on deep courts, inland navigation, and user fees with the Senate. Uh, that will come later uh, in subsequent legislation. Uh, we have tried to talk to as many people in the House as possible about this, and at least at the authorization committee level, I think there's some pretty good sympathy for what we're trying to do. So what I would say is that we can solve this problem with the supplemental. We can put the sensing language in it, uh, we work out later. Uh, there is some important money in it, as you know, for uh, foreign policy purposes, about $2 billion. Israel and Egypt, and uh, both houses have agreed on that. There's $250 million for Jordan, which is a late request that has been added to the Senate, and we certainly hope that uh, that can be accepted in the Congress. <coughs> both bills also and finally contain funds, uh, humanitarian assistance in Nicaragua. The numbers are slightly different, about 10 or 12 million apart. Uh, some of the uh, procedures and mechanisms are different. But after a strong show on both sides, uh, we hope that this could be worked out as well. So overall, I think uh, there's a good reason to believe that these small remaining differences on the supplemental can be worked out. We'd like to see it happen this week, uh, but uh, if it takes longer, it can take longer, but certainly there isn't much cause for uh, much greater delay. Uh, on the budget resolution, I think the blunt fact is that we are stuck in mud. Uh, and uh, that isn't necessarily any adverse reflection on any of the parties uh, to this dispute. I think it's fair to say that everyone has agreed that we can't tolerate these massive deficits, that we have to have a dramatic scale back in the next budget year and beyond. And I think both houses have indicated overwhelming agreement with that principle by whacking out at least a quarter of a trillion dollars from the baseline budget over the next three years, but the House and Senate budgets do that. The muddle, unfortunately, lies in the mix of, of those measures that we put together in order to bring that deficit down. And I would just like to report here very quickly that as a matter of basic math, there's only five ways or five areas that we can go to to deal with the deficit that's this big now, $200 billion. They're obvious, defense number one, cost of living entitlements number two, Structural reform of some of the big domestic programs like Veterans Health, General Revenue Sharing, or Medicare number three. Freezes on the routine operations of the federal government, smaller programs number four, and revenues obviously number five. I'd just like to quickly indicate where we are in this conference uh, because we're not, uh, we have to come together, but I think if everybody would focus on uh, some of the uh, areas where we have uh, uh, closer agreement should be possible to work out the big gaps that remain. Now, on defense, I think it would be fair to say that the administration has made substantial concessions and compromises as this process has worked along until it's reached the conference stage. And by supporting the Senate resolution, we have been, we have agreed over the next three years, relative to our January request for defense, 
cut $125 billion in budget authority over the next three years and $84 billion in outcomes. And that's a substantial change. It's a substantial uh, concession. We're getting pretty close to the bone, and I hope everybody agrees with that. The difficulty is that the House resolution would go beyond that with an additional $32 billion in budget authority cuts and $84 billion, or excuse me, $22 billion in outlays beyond where we've ended up in the Senate uh, over the next three years already. I think the President's made it very clear that on the budget authority, we have to draw the line. We need 033 in terms of real growth. We need a number of about $302 billion in terms of budget authority for 1986. We can't go below that. I think in the area of outlays, it's possible to go below where the Senate is. <coughs> Spending is coming in slower than we expected. It's possible, I think, to talk about splitting the difference or making some concessions to the House on outlays. But uh, we have made major concessions on defense. And really, we're not that uh, far apart if we can get the House to focus on the minimum need in terms of budget authority. Now, major entitlements, uh, co cost of living entitlements, uh, Social Security, uh, retirement, and so forth. The Senate has $34 billion in savings. Over three years, the House doesn't have any. We're pretty close to what might be called the political deadlock on that matter. But I would just say to all of you here today, from the budget point of view, that there are $250 billion worth of cost of living pensions in the federal government. Not the means tested, not the poor, the cost of living pensions. It's a quarter of the entire budget. You can't do anything in that area. It's going to be exempted entirely. Pretty hard to see how we can get this budget under control and get a meaningful deficit reduction. Further point is that there are no means tested programs in this category, We're not dealing with the poor, and uh, if necessary, uh, offsets can be proposed for those below the poverty line, as the Senate is indicating. Third category domestic structural reform, including things like agriculture and Medicare, as I mentioned before. The House has about $45 billion in savings over three years. The Senate has $75 billion over three years. So again, there's a gap of about $30 billion in terms of the savings that we need. I believe the House conferees have offered to come up by $10 billion in savings, or close one-third of the gap. But I would uh, have to say again that I don't know how you get there in terms of closing this deficit if we can't do any better than that. And again, this category doesn't include any means tested programs. Fourth area is the routine operations of government um, and some of the smaller grant programs. The House has about $23 billion in savings over three years, the Senate $34 billion, and most of that difference is accounted for by some of the low income appropriated programs. I believe the Senate has indicated a willingness to compromise a good way towards the House in this area, and uh, I would hope at least that could be only a minor area of difference. Uh, uh, as we try to work this through. Final and the fifth area is obviously revenues, and I think the President's made it very clear uh, that we have to start on the spending side, and revenues are the last resort after the budget has been cut to the minimum essential level of government that we need. It's pretty obvious that we haven't reached that point yet, and I think that the fact that neither the House or the Senate resolutions contain any revenues is pretty good agreement that the, for the moment anyway, <coughs> So I would say, in summary then, if you take these five areas of the budget and look at our arguments and disagreements over the mix, that we only have moderate differences left in Category 1 defense. It seems to me the regional men should be able to solve this. We have major differences left in Category 2, the cost of living entitlements, Category 3, the domestic structural reforms. But I think that somehow we've got to get this solved the deficit to continue to grow and weaken the economy, sooner or later, the solution will be, be, be beyond anything any of us can reach. So that's kind of the status report, a quick outline of where the differences are. I know these things are very tough politically, but uh, if we can't get it done this week, I certainly hope that everybody will keep working at it, because we've got to have a budget, and we've got to have a big reduction. Uh, well, I might uh, just mention that there's a difference between the House and the Senate on that, but I think uh, everybody has been around this track long enough to know that if you put something on paper, it doesn't mean you save any money unless you implement it and enforce it. And 
And uh, I believe that if you're going to uh, face uh, all of the political pressure that comes from trying to cut some of these programs, then it's important to actually deliver the savings with an enforcement mechanism, and uh, therefore a strong reconciliation is needed. And uh, obviously there's more of that in the Senate approach than in the House. That's another thing that uh, has to be worked on in this conference. <coughs> All right, thanks, Dave. I'm getting around the country as much as I have lately. I believe the people of this country are counting on us to cut spending and reduce the deficit. We've all made concessions during this budget process, as Dave said. You know, the other day I was interested to read something that was spoken in 1976 when Senator Hugh Scott was delivering his farewell to the Congress and leading government. And the bulk of his speech had to do with things that he had once believed, but had come to understand, or at least in his view, uh, well, he disagreed with his previous beliefs. And he concluded his speech with this line, <clears throat> beware of governments that soar into the infinite and dive into the unfathomable, but never pay cash. <laughs> well, I hope that the <clears throat> House and the Senate can resolve the differences as soon as possible. I want to thank Dan Rostenkowski, Bob Packwood for their commitment to, the, to pass the tax reform legislation this year. It's going to take a lot of work by all of us, but we should work together to get it passed and get it passed this year. And I'd like to call on Jim Baker for some comments and then ask him to take your questions. One month ago this week that you launched tax reform, and I, I have to say that we're very pleased with the uh, with the response so far, and particularly with the bipartisan nature of the response. Uh, as you said, uh, when you when you launched the proposal, tax reform is not something that's going to pass unless there is bipartisan support. Obviously, we were encouraged by the uh, response to the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee speech following your speech. We were likewise encouraged by uh, Senator Packwood's commitment to expedite the process. Uh, further encouraged when the speaker testified before the Ways and Means Committee and in effect said that he would hope that the House could act so that the Senate would have a bill uh, by Thanksgiving and we hope that he still feels that way. Uh, the best way, I think, Mr. President, to beat tax reform is to delay. And for this reason, we're extremely extremely pleased that the leadership has committed uh, to move tax reform and to move it this year. I, I guess the only other point I would make uh, since we're, the process is just beginning is that, that we've been at it long enough to the point I think we could say that the bottom line is that we've got here something that's never been accomplished before in this country and that's an overall uh, complete overhaul of the tax system. We got a 461 page proposal and yes there have been some shots taken at it and yes there are areas in which people have differences and criticisms and disagreements but basically the overall structure of the proposal we think when you consider what we're undertaking is standing up pretty darn well uh, through the legislative process so far we're in the fourth week of hearings in the house and we're in the third week of hearings uh, before the senate finance committee so we think so far there's really been no compelling uh, criticism of the overall structure of the tax proposal. That's not to say that there won't be changes uh, as we move along the line. If that's where I think we are. I'd be delighted to try and answer questions. Yes, sir, Bill. Uh, Jim, uh, as Chairman of the House Budget Committee, uh, I have a concern about the testimony that you gave up before Chairman Rostenkowski about the loss of revenues uh, over a several year period. I believe you testified that it a loss of $11 to $12 billion. Uh, has there been any rethinking, uh, particularly since I see in the newspaper, there's some possibilities for rethinking of the part of Treasury about the tax uh, bill, uh, the reform package, because I certainly uh, have a strong support of tax reform. I'm going to the of the House on that issue, but I'm deeply concerned about a tax reform package that would increase uh, the deficit. 
Uh, Bill, as, as far as the, the rethinking uh, uh, article that you're, that you're referring to, we are in the process now, as, as matters come up uh, before the committees, we take each of those criticisms and we analyze them where we think, there's, where they, we think there might be some merit. Quite frankly, we think that there may well be some merit uh, with respect to the criticism that some two earner families in the middle income group are going to be adversely affected as a result of our changing the child care credit to a child, um, the ch child care uh, credit to a child care deduction. The way that interrelates with the new rate structure is liable to adversely impact, we think it might adversely impact some middle income families. And so we're studying that and we may have some, we may have some uh, suggestions to offer uh, to uh, the chairman of, uh, of Ways and Means and the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee if, it, if we conclude that that is in fact the case. Uh, we don't think that the problem, right now, we don't think that problem goes beyond that. The numbers that we have submitted, uh, that we submitted during my testimony and that the President made public when he, when he announced the proposal, to the effect generally that people in the under $20,000 class get an 18.3% tax reduction. Those numbers are bad. People between 20 and 50,000 get a 7.2% tax reduction. Those numbers are valid. People over 50 get a 5.8% tax reduction. Those numbers are valid. There will be some two earner families in that middle income group who might be adversely affected. Now, with respect to your question about, about revenue neutrality, what I have said is that we, we would anticipate that the proposal would lose $11 billion over a five-year period. We gain $1.2 billion, we think, in the first year. We lose about $1.2 billion in the last year, and it, uh, it moves around in between them. We say that's revenue neutral, Bill, because you have to compare that against receipts during that five-year period of $4.7 trillion. So you're within 0.24% of revenue neutrality, and that's about as close as you can get on, uh, on estimate. Did you say up to 1% would be revenue neutral? That's the, that's the standard that's generally been used, uh, as I understand it, at Treasury, Bob. 1% either way is revenue neutrality, just because you can't get much closer than that on an estimated basis. <coughs> Jim, I, our committee is still scrubbing those numbers, and I'm hoping that if we come up with any more uh, losses, that you know, there will be a cooperative effort on the part of the Treasury. You testified before that before my committee, and I, I just hope that that's, that, that well, companionship will com continue to remain. The President said uh, as long ago as the State of the Union that he wants tax reform to be revenue neutral. He doesn't want it to be a tax increase in disguise, but he doesn't want it to exacerbate the deaths. Thanks, Jim. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come to the end of our lunch here, and I'd just like to say one thing. I know that you are all leaving this weekend for a brief Fourth of July holiday. I'll be left rattling around here in public housing <laughs> myself, having changed my vacation plan. I just want you to know that if you'd like to leave things in my hands, and be proud, <laughs> I'd be very happy to come to a solution and reach you with it from the feedback. It's a fait accompli. So uh, thank you all for, for coming here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. If anyone have any last questions or anything to aim at the three that have here before you or anyone else fire away and otherwise I guess we're going back to work. We just say thank you Mr. President for inviting us.
you ready? See if I can find a long go with his fake notes. I'll not try to interrupt. All right. I have to tell you something. I'll try to take care of your problem. Can you take care of that?